go and see the cinema. And I, I went and, and I came too late and there was uh, closed doors and I opened it and in, inside it was black. Just the, the behinds of the big uh, farmer's uh, lady were in front of me and I had to make my way through and then I saw and there was this luminous wall uh, and there was action on this wall and there was sun, sound and it was dark all, uh, and, and it was a publicity film for Dr. Oetker's vanilla pudding <laughs> and, uh, and that made me a filmmaker because I was fascinated not by the vanilla pudding because coming home my grandmother said, what pudding? Well, I make a better pudding than Dr. Oetker. And she did. And so it was not a pudding. <laughs> but it was this event which fascinated me. And when I was 17 years old in high school, I decided I would become a film. I would make film. And then I, when I was 18, I joined I went to film school to Vienna and it was awful because they brought me to, uh, or the other students, we, had, we could visit a studio and look at the filmmaking. And the, and the moment I crossed the threshold of the film studio, I knew this was not me. And, and, and I was desperate because I hated everything the cardboard architecture, the, the actors dressed up as something which was, had no, was not believable, and the whole climate and the whole, the whole fake of, of a feature film uh, uh, so repulsed me that I, was, I had a shock. And then uh, I started out uh, I went to Rome film school. It was a similar situation, just that it was better than the Vienna one. But they trained uh, people for the film industry. And uh, I didn't like the film, the industry. I didn't like the films that the industry made. I had been raised uh, uh, with music. My father was a musician. Uh, with literature, my aunt had books. and. Uh, I learned to read when I was five, and, and the films I, I didn't really like. But I wanted to be a filmmaker, so what to do? Today, there would be the role model of experimental or avant-garde. Or avant-garde was there, but it didn't apply to cinema where I was. Uh, so. I produced, or a friend of mine produced a, a, a kind of feature film uh, with a script and with actors, and, and which I made. And uh, when I looked at the rushes, that they, uh, the material that came back from the lab, um, and I was desperate because it was so bad, I was not interested in that. But then I received my first lecture by the film itself. And what the film taught me was that it came, I use this symbolically, it came from the lab, not in one rail or what one piece of hardware like today, right? you have a CD or whatever, it came in two. And one was the image and the other was the sound. And, and then there was no way of making it, of, of receiving it in one piece. Because the greatness of sound cinema is not that I can reproduce nature, so to speak, as it is. Yeah. That's, uh, that's nature. It's mandatory. 
The greatness of sound is that in cinema I can put together sound and image in my way, not the boredom of everyday nature. I can, but it's difficult to imitate. That is what cinema gives me. And then I have everybody of you knows what has happened. You see, because you know this. This is how we cope with the universe. When we hear this, we know this has happened. And the filmmaker is liberated from this iron law of nature that sound and image come together. And it is, of course, manifested in my head, which is the model for film camera, of course. Here are the ears, and here are the eyes. And today we know through biology or physiology that these are two different machines who have, which have nothing in common. They, the only thing they have in common, the only thing which is special, is that they sit in the same, what we call, head, at the same position, same piece, in space, in the universe, you see? Is, as, is this, uh, how shall I say? Yeah? This is the head of the filmmaker. Yeah? This is only the eye, so it stands for the eye. Yeah? And there is another one, for the ear. But in nature, they sit together. And if they, and here is the brain. The brain is this. The brain is the screen. Yeah? With the speaker behind, comes from the center of the screen. I am speaking not about Dolby madness. I am speaking about humble, simple, mono sound, mono screen which has the fantastic situation that sound and image come from the same place and are identifiable as belonging together. When I, have, uh, when I want to create a sync moment after my <coughs> yeah, here I have said something. Yeah? It says everything and nothing. It just says flapping. Yeah? But when I have, ah, I, the brain gets at the same time clapping, which is harmless. Yeah? It might be applause, it might be a part of applause, it might be just silence, please. Yeah? Anyway, there is a, a bunch of associations coming with this. And when I have, ah, there is an other bunch of associations coming with the sound. And when I put them together, ah, they work together, like raspberries and milk at the same time in the mouth. Yeah? Tells you the person who made this owned the woods and owned the cows. Raspberries and milk. Ah, eyes and ears. By creating this simultaneous events for the brain, I can show, I can express an opinion, an opinion about the world, not reproduce the world. The world is there anyway. Everybody can read everything or nothing. I have to point my finger on something and say, look, to uh, make, you, make myself understood, to say something about things. Many artists who were or, already also theoreticians have pointed this out. Van Gogh, one of them, he wrote, I do not paint nature. I say something about nature. And this is what the filmmaker does. As I repeat, I want you to look through my eyes and hear through my eyes and get my opinion. 
And this artificial creation of sync, sound and image, and then I put it together and make the combined brain. Yeah? But it has my things, not what the factory gives me with the new Sony that has everything at the same place at the same time. Of course, you can take it apart uh, with the digital medium too. Once you have learned the lesson from whom? From analog cinema. You see, that's one of the great things of analog cinema, that it is so open. It shows what it does. It shows what it is. Um, it teaches you how to speak with it. Because it came in two, in two reels, yeah? I had to try to put it together. And then I started, uh, and I failed. It, didn't, it wasn't in sync. So then, not being in sync, I just f went further away. And suddenly, there was something very interesting. Because it said, so, when the rifle was uh, detonated. Yeah? And so, cinema, open cinema, teaches you what the audiovisual uh, is about. Um, at the end, um, I will be glad to receive also questions, and I will try not to speak too long in uh, one uh, attempt. So um, we will now repeat um, Adeba. My films are made um, to be seen many times. Uh, this is uh, something which is not planned for commercial cinema or for the mainstream cinema. You see, when you when you go to the cinema and you say, what's, what's, what, what are the show tonight? And they say, I don't know, Gone with the Wind. And they say, well, I, sh I have seen this already. Not with the poem. Not with the painting. And not with the film, which is condensed. Yeah? Condensed, it's the condensation that gives longevity to the works, be literature, music, film. So, um, uh, Tor, please. You see, I address a living person in a tour. Mm -hmm. We show the next article, please. Cinema is archaic. It is not running automatically. There's somebody behind. I will show him to you later. <laughs> We go, we go on. Thank you. Ah, yeah.
this film I called metric films, metric film, because you might have felt it has a metric rhythm. The length of the shots are equally long, 26 frames, a little more than a second. And uh, all, every shot exists in positive and in negative, and they change positive, negative, positive, negative. And the element which gives, which dictates this rhythm, is a piece of pygmy music. They are wonderful musicians, I always admire them. So I, I took a piece of music from them. It was an, a, it was on a on a strip, and it went. Da la la tip da la la da la la tip da la la tip. Now, you see. The stream of time cannot be stopped. Yeah, Heraclit, yeah. 550 before Christ, said. Uh, you cannot step in the same river because it will not be the same river. Everything flows, so time flows. But if you put time on this, on a strip like this, and you see that you see already that there are regular images. Dun Dun, 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 dun. Uh, and you know, of course, you have looked at the projector, and you know how this goes through a projector. Yeah? It walks through the projector in a regular speed. Yeah? And uh, you now can. You have a public, as I said, this contract between filmmaker and public, that the public sits mm -hmm. and gives their time. These two hours or one and a half hours, they give you that. And then the natural flow of time doesn't exist anymore. The time which you believe that you are living happens here. And for this time, I am God. Yeah. And I say, now this, now that, now this, now that. You know uh, what I tell you here? People like uh, Preminger uh, never knew because they had never seen a film strip. They came from the theater and they thought cinema is when you dress up so-called actors, uh, fakers, uh, imposters, to do as if they were somebody else, which they really never succeed. Nobody would ever believe uh, that uh, uh, Marlon Brando was ever uh, the things that he tried to imitate. I mean, he was always the great Marlon Brando, and never a baker, never a sheriff, and never an Indian, and never anything else. Uh, so, also you learn that what is an actor when, it, when he is on film? <laughs> He's a, a shadow uh, at most. Yeah? And I can, I can, now here is the dangerous tool of the filmmaker, you know? That's, that makes me god of time. Yeah? Because here is time going, yeah? And, and I say now, end of time. <laughs> yeah? uh, it's, it's up to me when an event ends. Yeah? Uh, you know why I learned this? The Preminger always had the money to have his staff of people who kept him away from the real uh, 
place where film happens, namely here. Uh, 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 because I was poor. I was so poor I could not if afford a screening room to look at my rushes or an editing table to look at what I did. I had nothing. After my first film, the, the film uh, milieu threw me out. That was in 1955. And there was no other place to go but in the avant-garde. That's so they say, you go, you are not a film. You don't belong to us, you whatever, wherever you go. And then the avant-garde, the artists, uh, so to speak, uh, embraced me, the, the world. I, I had to go. I didn't plan. I never wanted to be an artist. I wanted to make films. But I wanted to make films as I thought was best. And not what the producer told me, because he had been told by the distributor, who had been told by the bank, who had been told by the people who, who paid for the whole thing. You see, this is this chain of slaves that leads the, to the screen of the mainstream cinema. Yeah? Nobody, so you have to free yourself from it, but, of course, you pay for that. You have no audience. You have no money. And if the banks close down your medium, like they did with me, fortunately, I am almost 80 now, and, and my filmmaker's life ended, uh, uh, they take it away from you. Because the avant-garde can never pay for the medium. The avant-garde always is um, uh, a, a, a partisan, a guerrilla, who, who steals. You see, I stole all my films. I, had a, I look back to a wonderful life of a criminal. <laughs> because uh, when this film was made, a friend of mine who was a poet, Konrad Bayer, good Austrian poet, who killed himself, by the way, um, persuaded the owner of a nightclub to that he should have a publicity film for his nightclub. And uh, a very small sum was paid. And uh, I had nowhere to go, so we just I just could buy a roll of film and the development of the film. Uh, and then I could not even look at it. And then come the next lesson by analog cinema. Because the lab sent me this. And unlike the digital medium, which uh, if the whole chain of technical apparatuses does not work, is dead. Film is not dead, because I wanted to know what's on the film, and I, I used the sun, yeah? my fingers, my eyes, and I, I, I saw what's on the film. And then, from the position of what was on the film, I would imagine what would happen on the screen in terms of movement. Movement in time, because I know 24 frames is a second. Now, how much is a second? I can tell you, because I found out um, when I put the film here and to my elbow, that's a second. <laughs> you, as a filmmaker, you are in a, such an archaic position that you can uh, establish a relationship between the material you work with. One, two seconds, three seconds. Huh? Like the archaic violin player who 
whose movements are translated in ba, 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 directly on his medium. Body intelligence, body memory, body feeling, instead of uh, pragmatic formulas, mathematics. Yeah? Um, this is a quality which film was the last to represent. Yeah? Uh, analog filmmaking is still uh, has elements that go back to Stone Age, such as looking at something and reading it. Yeah? Um, uh, Tor, please, let's go again. I continue the theme of poverty as a, as a teacher and of film as a teacher. The next film was again a, a publicity film and a commission to make a fi film publicity for beer. Schwächert uh, beer is a very famous Austrian beer, beer, very wealthy people own it and uh, uh, I hoped to, be, to get a subsidy to make film, make what I believed in should be made. They called me and they said, yeah, yeah, well, what you explain is, is interesting, but uh, you show your talent first, we give you a, a, a commission, you make a film for our beer, and then we will see what comes. And so I said, yes, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, we had various talks about the projects and we couldn't really find a common denominator so I thought I'd just get out of this project and I decided I would make everything they dictated and they said we rent the most expensive restaurant in Vienna <coughs> we, rent, we uh, hire the beauty queens and uh, they drink beer from champagne glasses so that it's an uplift for our beer. And they say, you, you would be even able to guess what they would say, Schwächerter, ah. <laughs> That's what they were to say. So I said, okay, I will, I will do. And they were astonished, there was no opposition f 
from me and they said, but Mr. Kubelka, you came to us as a young artist and um, we want you that this is really what you as an artist want to do. And I said, well, <laughs> excuse me, but you dictated me this and I, this is not what I am as an artist want to do, but I will do it for you, to, so it's done. And they said, no, 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 no. You have to believe in what you do. So go home, come back in two, three weeks, and then let's talk again. I went home and I understood what was asked from a young, talented artist, namely to lie about your plans. And I came back and I sa they said, oh, so you have something new. I said, yes, and what is it? We, we rent the expensive restaurant, we hire the beauty queens, they say schwächer da a. And they say, oh, uh, but this is really what you as an artist uh, believe in, this is what you want to say. I said, yes, this is what I want to say. And so they said, oh, we, we go ahead. And then we went ahead and uh, they had given me a very small advance, which again just was enough to buy a roll of film and some money for developing it, but no money for renting a camera. So I went to the university, a friend of mine was an assistant there, we borrowed a, an old uh, camera from the biology department from the 1925, uh, which had a handle and was <laughs> hand crank, no viewer, really no viewer, a magazine, and, but it was already the 35, so I, I threaded the, in the night, I put the film in it, and then there was the restaurant, they had organized everything, the beauty queens, and, and I had, <coughs> there I invented my uh, security, security dress, namely the dark suit with a, I show you, it was a little bit too hot, so I, didn't. I went like this, Um, three-piece suit, hmm? and I looked like a Vienna bourgeois, which is, uh, of, uh, I had learned my lesson from Kleider machen Leute, that they would not suspect anything if you looked like them. And uh, so <laughs> they started to make these beauty queens drink the beer and schwächerter and ah, and I was turning the thing. And I also had my friend from the university was with me. He also wore, uh, wore a suit and he acted as my assistant, which is important that you have an assistant because in the hierarchy you must not be the, the lowest one, you see? Filmmaker just with a camera, so I, he was my assistant. We put the camera on beer cases symbolically because it was a beer film. And, uh, <clears throat> and then we, we went on. And they had sent an expert to control that I really filmed what they had said. And I did it, although the film had already run out because it's only two minutes, 60 meters, it's, it's not much. Uh, and uh, we worked for three, four hours and I was turning and then I got some drinks because I said that the mannequins uh, were not really temperamentful uh, enough, and 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 so every in the end of the shooting, everybody was happy, and I went home with my film. It was developed, and uh, I found what you have seen partly here, namely a shot with a beauty queen and doing like this, uh, putting down the beer. There was another one where uh, the girls sit in front of a tapestry, and there was some foam, um, the hand of the waiter pouring, and that was it. Um, <clears throat> and then um, I started to think, what will I do now? Um, at that time, what I wanted to do is make a memorial, make a celebration of the flow of the universe. Uh, 
Again, when I was young, we did uh, cow herding in the summer. I had a friend, Mesna Franzi, and uh, we were sitting, making a fire. Later, I understood that the beginning of art was maybe done, as we see it, of philosophy by herd uh, shepherds, because they have time. Once the cows were in place, you see, you don't have to do anything anymore. Now the shepherds, wonderful, if you go to Greece, you can still see they have the dogs who do the work. Yeah? The shepherd just whistles and the dog works. And the shepherd has leisure and sits and watches the universe. Because nothing happens except the universe. In our case, clouds, yeah? some clouds. And I was sitting there and I, I saw a cloud and the cloud looked like a cow. And I said, and Franzi looked and said, a cool. And you see, you know what I did? I was the archaic inventor of art by successfully putting the attention of the viewer to my objet trouvé, my found object, which I identified as my articulation. Just as Marcel Duchamp did it for modern art in a new way. In, he took a toilet sink and signed it and said, look at it, this is my work. Yeah, this was in a different context. But the birth of art is the objet trouvé, because it is something, a medium, clouds, which make, give you a suggestion to think in a certain way. And since the human brain, in order to make us survive, is trained to make sense of everything, we think a cow. It, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, what does a cow on the, on the sky? And it's, uh, but this is how our brain works. And this is an objet trouvé. It's, a, it's, it's like a sculpture, but made by chance, by the wind, by the water, by the clouds, which becomes my work if I am, this is the archaic, the most archaic tool of the artist. Everybody will <laughs> look at him now, you see? Everybody will look at my eye. Yeah? I, I tell you where to look and give it attention. Yeah? I can say like this, and I can say, yeah? the ancient medium, point out something. So, <clears throat> when we went home with the cows, there was this river, a, a little bridge, which we had to cross. And I would always stop and look down in the river. And I would see this incredible complex cinema, I would later say, this found cinema down of seen from under the bridge. Yeah? play of light, play of waves, and maybe a fish. And <clears throat> when I made this Schwächerte film, this was what I wanted. I wanted to make a sculpture, a monument. I wanted to celebrate the fact that there is an incredible show going on, made by nature, but not chaos, just very complex. Like the water comes, uh, springs out of the earth and flows down and has a rhythm. And there is a second source and some water comes with a rhythm. And then they meet 
And of course, this rhythm and this rhythm intersperse. Yeah? A, B. One, two, three, four. A1, B1. A2, B2. A3, B3. A4, B4. And now they are together. They intersperse. And then there comes maybe a curve and a stone, and another factor comes in. And then between my cinema under the bridge and the sun, which by the way is the projector light, uh, are clouds, a film. Yeah? And they determine the, the light that is uh, uh, playing on the water. And this is what I made then out of this material. I made 12 strips of film, each one making a loop, a repetition of one movement. Yeah? Uh, and then I laid them out, all 12, and they were all 1,440 frames long, a long a, a, a publicity film has to have, the length. And then I wrote the score, and they went into each other, and this film uh, came out. And you have all the rhythms, all the rhythms there, but none in completion. Theoretically, they run behind this film. And you always see one frame here and one frame from there. Can we uh, uh, tour? We repeat Schwächeter, please. Thank you very much. Um, I will be happy to answer your questions, whatever it is. Yes. Um, what I, pardon, uh, uh, can you say it again a little louder, please? Yeah. I don't expect anything of anybody. Um, you see, I work, <coughs> I, I work when I work uh, towards a certain result that uh, would interest me, myself. And uh, since I am not of the opinion that I am a special human being, I'm normal just like you, so what I might like, somebody else might like. And uh, um, th the film, when I saw the film for the first time, I didn't know how it would look because I haven't, hadn't seen it. I had only planned it, the first in 1960. And uh, what especially interests me, or interested me working with this new medium uh, is like, uh, if you make a comparison with Columbus and his ship. When Columbus went to America, or he didn't know he was going to America. He, he, he thought he would go to India. Uh, um, and if you would have asked him, uh, what, do you, uh, what do you expect to be there? He would have said, uh, I don't know. I, this is why I go there, in order to see what is there. So before I had made this film and seen it, I, I didn't know what it was. So uh, for ex it is always the media who teach mankind what to think and what to see. Uh, if you take the romantic uh, movement, let's say, you see uh, uh, poetry, painting, uh, they developed a, f an, a new feeling. When, when you look at, at this, uh, paintings and you read the poetry, you get a feeling which was not there before. Yeah? And if you liked my film or not, or my films, nothing else was there 
before in other media. It's only cinema that, that can, uh, that introduces you in, in a way of, of feeling then becomes feeling and whatever you have, you have. And of course, the more you see the films, uh, uh, the, the feeling will also change. There were people, uh, or, or I, I mean, it's, it's, it's not important. The, the other thing I want to compare my work is like a scientist. You see, you work toward a result. You don't know the result when you start working. When you have it, it's there and, and it, it will not go away if you don't like it. And so I don't work for the psyche of people whose thinking I already know. This would be the mainstream cinema making. When you say, now I make them laugh and it's enough and now I, <laughs> I give suspension. And this is working the known mind in a known way. This is not w what I was out for. When I saw, when I made Schwächerter, you see, it was like an, for me, like an atomic explosion. Uh, I derived an energy out of one minute film, which, which no other visual medium was, uh, would be able to create. You see, because cinema make, uh, gives me the possibility to exchange the whole field of vision 24 times a second. And, and so, uh, <coughs> so anyway, uh, I don't expect a certain f uh, reaction or feeling from, from you. you. If you give yourself to me for this time, amount of time, here you are, and, and let's see what happens. Yes. It's a very, very good question because uh, <clears throat> one reason why I, I, you see, I do not let my films be transferred into the digital medium. One of the reasons is that I believe that every medium uh, only uh, gives the whole content if it exists in the original form. Uh, like a painting when you make a photographic reproduction, will never, the reproduction will never uh, tell you what the painting uh, is telling you. Uh, an, an example would be, um, <clears throat> we are used to go to the museum and see back to, let's say, Gothic painting, uh, very powerful uh, colors, well lit. And then when we come to a uh, Romanesque chapel, a crypta, and there are uh, uh, alfresco paintings on the wall, and they are very well lit, they look crummy, they look poor. Be why? Because they were, uh, they were not made with this kind of light. Th they were made with candlelight. See, once uh, uh, I was in a cave in France where they have these cave paintings and <laughs> they look crummy and then, then the light went out and the guide would light uh, a, a little, uh, um, what is it called, a tune torch, a, a match, yeah, and suddenly uh, there was a, a drawing right down there. It, it was incredible because it was made with this kind of light, with just a little light. Yeah? So the, the, the works do not exist alone. It's important that they are with what made them, what created them. In German, Umfeld, you see? Uh, um, Old music cannot be played with modern instruments. This was a huge, uh, it, 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 I like the comparison very well. Um, when Bach died, 1750, a new 
a generation of instruments uh, were developed, namely instruments uh, like the transverse flute, uh, who could play loud and soft. And before, the harpsichord only can play one level of sound, always the same. The organ, one level of sound. Recorder, one level of sound. Uh, the violas, one level of sound. And then came the violins, who could play loud and soft. And all the instruments, the new ones, played loud and soft. And then the composers composed music which depended on being loud and soft. When you would play, you see, Beethoven, Beethoven's success was because it was loud and soft. If you would play Beethoven on old instruments, it would be nothing, you see? So, old music was forgotten 18, until 1850, 100 years. Uh, and, and then nobody knew uh, the old composers. And then people said, what's, what's with our past, our heritage? We want that. Where is it? And then uh, some musicologists started to uh, get old uh, uh, scores. They were forgotten. They developed, they translated them in modern writing so one could read it. And then they started to play it and they found out it was crummy. And then they, they said, it, uh, um, William Morris was one of the uh, people who, who drove in this direction. He said, let's build the old instruments again. And then a whole movement started of building old gambas, harpsichords, recorders. Uh, and it, it lasted another 100 years, from 1850 to 1950, because they had to train new musicians who could play the old instruments well enough. And from 1950 on, we have now again the sound of, of the old music, not 100%, but so that we can understand the content of, of the old music. And that is the case with cinema and digital copies, digital prints of, of them. I don't say don't work with the digital, this is something else. I do believe that digital <coughs> Uh, whatever you call digital movies are, are not really hopeful, you see, because they, you have to work with the strong sides of, it, of a medium. And, and, uh, and, sorry, and in digital, the strong sides is interaction and it's life event. Both things cinema cannot do. And so uh, the digital will develop in a completely different direction soon. It's, it's already doing it. Um, but the important thing is to understand that uh, the, the way a film is made, yeah, and, or a painting is made, you know, see, is important for the content. It's, it's, it's not easy to understand, but because we, we are trained to think in finished products, like in food, we say, this is camembert, yeah? a French cheese, and it's, it's like this. But what it is, is mother's milk of a mother cow for her baby, which uh, uh, the baby never got because we went in between and, and we got the milk that sees now the light of day. And we we keep we outsource it to bacteria and they work and 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 transform it in if we get, if we hire the right bacteria they transform it in a way that we like and now it becomes harder and harder and then and then it reaches a stage where we say this is camembert and we buy and eat it but if we don't buy and eat it it continues it, and it, it, it gets more creamy, and then it gets more, it stinks more, and then it gets more dry, and it stinks less, and it ends as a piece of dust. Yeah? So where is, you see, there is, it's Heraclit again. You cannot stop the flow of things. We just declare something. Yeah? And so it is with film. You see, if there is the strip that runs to the projector. You can see, is the projection really so important? Uh, uh, the, the projector with the film running through 
is an incredible work. You know why? Because the projector with the film strip running through depicts portraits our situation in the cosmos. Namely, there is the sun, which is static, always light. There is the earth turning. And because it turns, it is day and it's night. Because when we're away, day, night, day, night, day, night. Now, we can say this is the cyclic view of the world. Everything repeats. Yeah? Days and nights and days and nights. And, and my heartbeat, ba-boom, ba-boom. And breathing. And uh, birth and sex and reproduction and every human being the same. Eyes, nose, mouth. All repeats, all repeats. All is cyclic. And that's what the projector depicts. Namely, there is a tamed sun, yeah, the, the, the lamp, or the, no, the, the, uh, the source of light. In front of it, there is a turning shutter, round, and half of it is black metal. I'm talking about the primitive old model. And half of it, there's nothing. So if this turns in front of the uh, lamp, it is exactly a model of our Earth uh, going around the sun. Yeah? There's the sun, always steady, and then it, the, the Earth turns and makes light and darkness, light and darkness. And it does this in a speed that every second we have 24 days and 24 nights, you see? And the human animal has, now I come to the chronologic, not the cyclic, the chronologic, one after the other. You see, the, the steps are always the same, but they lead me here in the new place, and the new place, which means this is our fate, shiksal, life events, and they happen during the day, because the human animal sleeps by night. And the film sleeps by night, when the projector is dark and nothing happens. But the trick is that while it's dark, of course, two anthropomorphic fingers get into the holes in the film and transport a new image which means chronologically another event, another day, in front of the sun. And then it becomes day, and poof, this day appears. And it is darkened again, and while it's dark, another day is prepared and comes on the screen. 24 times a second. Yeah? Yeah? Um, so the projector with the running film represents the cyclic principle of our universe and the chronological principle. The film strip is the chronology. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now and then and then and then and then and then. So uh, this is for me, so it's, it's, it's a philosophy. Uh, I don't think that the makers, the inventors of this machine have thought about this, you see? It came out of them, it grew out of them. Yeah? I only realized it long after I made uh, Anulf Reiner, that this is the case, but it is so. You see, all the, all the media which we uh, use uh, grow out of an imitation of, uh, of things from the outside world. I, I, I brought you an example here, which I did not use before. Very simple. Yesterday, there was this reception outside. And my wife and I, we stole our uh, cutlery. 
which was, of course, plastic. And, um, and just to, to, to show you, what is this? Yeah, this is a, a spoon. So it's a spoon. But what it really is, where it comes from, is it's an underarm, it's a forearm from here to here. See? And then a hand, a hollow hand. This is a spoon. Yeah? And now, uh, in history, we have learned to make smaller ones, still smaller ones, all kinds of forearm and hollow hands. And we use it like this, or we make it a shovel. Or, but the model is always this, and it comes out from our own body. And uh, this is the fork. Forearm, again, yeah? and four fingers but small enough to, to stick in, into a purse or, or, or a, a whatever. You see? Because this would be too clumsy and, 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 and too, too, too dirty, so we, we, this is... But this is not the invention of a Mr. So-and-so. This grows out. Yeah? Uh, the knife's um, a finger and, and these teeth, eye, te eye tooth. A saw, like a saw, yeah? many of them. It's, it's the eye tooth that can grip. Yeah? And then the movement, and we separate things which in nature were not separated. So uh, there is, uh, of course, the, film, uh, the filmmaker's tool, the scissors, is the teeth again, yeah? cutting, cutting. Uh, uh, when you, I mean, you, once you set yourself thinking on that, you can look up every medium and you will see it's essential that it is not a copy, that it is the thing itself. One, one more example, there is lace, this kind of laces, you know, which you, you knit, and you, it takes you a long time to do this. And, and it's, when you see it, it's precious. And you, you put it on your table and you put something on it and it becomes precious. Yeah? And these have been copied in, in paper. They, they make it, it's very cheap, and clunk, 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 and, and you get it in the restaurants. And it's worth nothing. It's not precious. It's, it's, it's nothing. It doesn't work. Because, because the original thing carries the amount of work with it. It tells you. My grandmother sat for three weeks making this, knitting, knitting this, you see? Uh, it is very important that the hole is there. In sports, you have high jumping and you have pole vault. And if you use the pole, of course, you jump f uh, five meters. And if you, without, you jump also, but you jump also only two meters. And so when you say jumping, yeah, it's not jumping, it depends how you do it. And, and, and film is the same thing. It's, uh, yes? I think it's a, it's a bit dangerous what you're saying. Mm. I, I agree that one preferably to watch the original. But if you were talking about head painting, you can't do it again because you destroy it when you visit it because it's not meant to have that much uh, power You are completely right. 
and, and I take this risk because I am a warrior. I do it polemically and I say if you let analog film uh, go into oblivion, if you quit, so I quit, oh, I'm dead. I stay on the ship which appears to be sinking now in the belief it will not be sunk. And uh, this was with old music. Old music was dead. They had to revive it. You see, there is a hundred years of human thought inscribed in analog cinema. And if mankind lets it go away, and it, it, it survives only in digital copies, which will also, you see, digital is so short-lived, what people only start to, only a beginning to realize this horror of working in the digital medium because you have a lifespan of up three years, yeah? five years if, if it's good. Yeah? My son works for the digital industry in a, in a very well good position. He says, no, it's, it, it lasts forever. You only have to migrate every three years. <laughs> so imagine uh, where would be the pyramids if they would have had to be migrated every three years in order to be still there. Uh, the the short-livedness of the digital is so horrible that even the money people who don't care about the product are now worried and start to preserve their digital property, content property, on film again. Kodak the most immoral company who doesn't care for film at all anymore, it's not like Eastman who really loved it, uh, um, they came out with a new long uh, living film stock where they guarantee you at least a hundred years uh, um, and they call it asset protection. You see this irony because they don't, they say not content protect, asset, so they, for the money people, assets, you own content, so you want to keep your assets, not the content, but the assets. Yeah? So they developed an asset protection material. It's the revival, as you have to call it already like that, is already there. There is the silver lining. The other fact is that all, I, 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 I go quite around the world. Everywhere there are young people young people who have to start, I'm finished. They have to start and they want to work with something which is apparently going under. They don't care, they want to work with analog film. So the, the answer is not to also run away and throw yourself on another sinking ship, uh, but fight for the survival of what has a right to survive because it is unique. It has a hard core. What you have seen here tonight, like it or not, but this would have none of the films would have been made in the digital. And when you, when you show them digitally, it means nothing. Because they have been hand-tailored, yeah? With looking through, not, and it, this shows in the films, yeah? So uh, uh, analog film is not over. But you, you are right, and I'm, I worry every day that uh, my films uh, are, do not have the presence uh, they, I would like them to have. And the future will be yours. Thank you. But, but I, I think for me the right way is to, to stick to the path I have followed all my life. Uh, I mean, I have been told all my life <laughs> this kind of film, why don't you uh, start now making a mainstream film? Yeah. Yes. And the other avant-garde filmmakers who work on Super 8 and do not make copies of that film, so every time the film is screened, it deteriorates, which is part of what they, what they expect and what is what is happening. So
you, you, are, you are right. I, for example, I want my films to be there forever. Yeah? And uh, my last films, uh, I have, if you follow the score, I have written down the score. The score exactly denominates them. So in a thousand years, you could remake them on film, of course. You would have to do this. Uh, and they would be there. Uh, um, Mm. Only the last one, only Arnulf Reiner and Antifund, because there is imagery in the others, and uh, the imagery cannot be reconstructed. And even, this is very interesting, even if you reconstruct Arnulf Reiner after the score, it will look different. And for me, it was such an experience after these 50 uh, plus years when I made Antiphon that I couldn't make it the same quality you, you will have seen and heard it. You see, the, 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 the sound, which is just white noise, uh, technically or theoretically can be reproduced. It could, we could not get the same sound than the one I had in 1960, because the machines had a little, some changes, and, and there, this rule that, you see, everything changes. So for me, between these two films, this, this means so much to me, these 50 years in between these two things, because it shows what 50 years do to a, a theorem that would say it's equal, you see? It's not. Yeah? And one has learned from photography now that suddenly old photographic prints became originals. Yeah? Because one knows now that you cannot make two photographic analog prints that look the same. Uh, so my, as I say, it's, it's very hard for me, and uh, there are a few others who also stick to film still. Robert Beavers is one, uh, but very few. And uh, of course there is a challenge, this is a challenge for the film archives and film museums. Um, there is an international federation of film archives. And uh, there is the discussion, what should the archives do? Should they stick to preservation and showing films, or should they be modern and show whatever is new? And most of them have opted for the second uh, uh, solution. They abandon the, the uh, analog material, which is for them criminal, you see? It's, it's like if, a, uh, if the National Gallery would throw away the original paintings and instead deliver wonderful prints that had been made and, 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 and in every size and, and so. If you substitute painting with uh, color prints, then the history of painting will be gone. And if you, if you transfer film on digital, film history is gone. Just very, very briefly, I'm not, I'm not doubting that we work in analog. What I'm just talking about, the reproduction of the work, the availability. And that's the point. And if you are not in the kitchen, or if you want to make it available, show a wider audience. Well, wide is, you see, I don't want that wide an audience. <laughs> 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 uh, I mean, the, the last two films uh, uh, are wonderful with this audience in this wonderful space. But I don't need these films on the, on the wristwatch size <laughs> under the shower, you see? Yes? Why is, why is the uh, analogy between the artifacts and our body so important for you, the speed and the I mean, I am not the first to have invented this. I mean, uh, there is uh, um, ethnology, there is uh, the theory of evolution, and it is just a fact that all these two, all tools are derived from either our own body or, for the, or from nature. Like this, for example, is a, 
is a cave full of water which has been carefully with a minimum uh, wall only made uh, to size so that I don't have to go to the source anymore, bow and uh, drink like a dog, but it comes to me, it, it, I can grasp it, yeah, begreifen, wonderful, uh, if you go to language, language teaches you so many of the basic principles, begreifen, that you un we understand things only really from touching, yeah, uh, not from looking. World view is a very bad world. Word, it should be world sucking, world licking, yeah? Because filmmaking is no different from cooking or any other thing that humans are doing. Uh, 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 what I, 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 I could not, did not finish the example, but uh, as I said, not only the fork is derived from the human body, but also the cinema. You are sitting in my head, you see? You see what I see, you hear what I have heard, yeah? Up there is the brain, which directs uh, the speaking apparatus, which is now uh, electrically. This is the, 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 the light source and the sound. It's, it, but it is a, this is my head. You're sitting in my head. So the, this analogy goes always. You just have to think about, uh, take whatever you need, and you will find where it comes from. Yes? What is your uh, relationship with the audience? I, I love, it, it's like when you have, it's a kind of sexual uh, uh, <laughs> a contact, you know, because I get into you, you see. <laughs> you open up to me, and uh, uh, of course an audience is wonderful. And I mean, a great Austrian musician, Arnold Schoenberg, uh, said, asked these questions, what do you think about the audience? He said, uh, an audience must be there because an empty room doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm not like that. I, I love an audience, but on the other hand, uh, not any audience is what I hope to be, you see? And, and so it's, uh, I love this audience. <laughs> I can feel that uh, there is an, uh, an interaction there. No? I have lived through horrible audiences. In <laughs> when I was younger, I was always only laughed at, and, and or people walked out. When I premiered this film, the last one, Anulf Reiner, there was a full, big audience, not as big as this, but maybe half of it. Everybody walked out in, except 12 people in six minutes, <laughs> and 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 they also friends good artists, and they said, well, it's boring. So audience is, a, is again, it's like uh, erotic uh, encounters. You have to be lucky, you have to, if you find a good audience, it's wonderful. Also, also uh, the, the, the analogy with sex is not just that, because it creates children. You see, if I can get into young people, uh, I have another 50 years of, <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> of thought. <laughs> yes? So obviously you don't think that the digital has derived from the analog, it has developed? Uh, digital has, of course, uh, the, uh, you see, it developed as partly new, yeah, out of technical possibilities that did not come from the analog film system. But as a, when it was born, it used the parent, which was analog film, as for the form. Just like when cinema was born, it used theater as parent, you see? And, and therefore, there is still the curtain left from this parentage, you see? A curtain has nothing, f uh, uh, the cinema does not need a curtain, you see? The curtain is there in order to hide the, the, the actors when they change or the, the 
architecture to be changed. But in the cinema, why a curtain? And, and, the early, and there were cinemas which, you see, I developed a, a, an ideal cinema called, I called it invisible cinema, because uh, I felt that film is not a social medium in the sense of 19th century melodrama, where the, 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 the booths were important, where people went dressed up in order to look at each other, maybe sometimes also on the, on the stage, but it was a different medium. Huh? A, a cinema should be like the interior, the dark interior of a camera, black, completely black, so that the only uh, reference is on the screen. The only spatial and optical reference that you get is on the screen. I called it invisible cinema. And I was able to uh, see, uh, I realized one version, 1970 in New York for Anthology Film Archive, uh, where I was one of the founders. And then I, another version in Vienna, in the Austrian Film Museum, which also I was one of the founders, and, uh, and it, it, I called it invisible because you shouldn't see it. You see, the cinema should not be there as, as, as a space, only the image. Yeah? Are they there? Sorry? Are they there? Uh, anthology is not there anymore in New York, but in Vienna, the film museum, the, it is there. Um, it is not as radical as in New York. The New York version also had partitions here in the seats, and they had a, uh, in front, you saw only black velvet, so that you couldn't see anybody but the screen. But here it was free so that you can touch your neighbor, yeah? because as an author of film, I need your eyes and ears, but I don't need I don't want to keep you from touching the thighs of your girlfriend that sits uh, next to you. And I also want you to hear laughter uh, or protest, whatever, but, but subdued, not so that it uh, uh, washes out what comes from the screen. So cinema is a, a communal experience for me. I like very much to not to have a single person. Which, which is also something in which direction the digital goes. Yeah? The digital goes to the single uh, event. Are both present? Pardon? Are both present? Both the and the Well, yes, yes, well, well you, you see, that, but that, uh, there is a historical connotation. Um, when I speak of music today, and I have uh, created a musical event, I would want an audience with a volume, people. Yeah? But this was not, it's not essential for music. Uh, once I was in Milan in the elevator and there was a, a man who was uh, carrying luggage and he had a little recorder, a flute in his pocket. And, and I play myself, and so I said, ah, you play the recorder. Where did you get it? And he said, I made it myself. And I said, ah, when, where do you play? He said, well, when I have time, I go out in the wood when, where there is nobody, e mi faccio una bella pifferrata. And I make myself a wonderful piping. Which, may, which means it is the work of art where one person does, is everything, maker of the instrument, composer of the work and public, uh, executor and public at the same time. So of course there are many possibilities for going out. But cinema, for me, I want an audience. I, not, I, I don't want it on a computer for, yes. Yes, I. Yeah, I hate art spaces and I hate gallery spaces. <laughs> <laughs> so it has to be in the cinema. Yes, 
people sitting, being concentrated, not walking around and having a glass of wine and talking about investment and, and so. Uh, so ar the art world is really down at the bottom at the moment. I mean, the artists are really the poorest. You see, they have money, but they don't have a public. They have investors. I have no investors, but I have a public. You are not here because it makes you money. Yeah? This, I know this. <laughs> and this is great. You see, I have good public. I have not much, but good. Yes. What was most important to you, the, the process of making a film or the process of showing a film? I mean, when you're making a film, I mean, you have no audience. But then you have the contact with the medium. Very, it, it, very good. It's the same sing, similar point. Uh, uh, making and showing is, is close together. When I make, I think of showing, you see? Uh, there is a wonderful uh, novel, by short one, by Kleist, German poet Kleist. And it's called The Development of Thoughts While You Speak. Also, the, the Entwicklung der Gedanken beim Sprechen. And, and he says, when he sits and there is his sister working, knitting, he starts uh, a conversation with her. And although she does not really understand everything he wants to say, he tells her some, some things and then he gets into an argument and, and he says things which he didn't know before and he didn't know where the conversation was going. And this is exactly the model for sculptors for filmmakers you see a filmmaker must be and this is the, the difference between mainstream and free uh, creating whatever you call it that you must be able to change direction while you work like a scientist you see you work on something you have to go and if you know already what you are working toward <laughs> you don't have to do it it's there you see it's not worth uh, the, the, the work so, so the making and, and the uh, event is one things that, thing that belongs together. When, when you have a violinist playing a concert, there are these million hours of exercising which you witness in, in this person. Yeah? And, and, and the CD does not give the content. Yes? Uh, do you consider yourself a storyteller? Yeah, why not? Uh, I mean, storyteller, what do you understand with the word, word storyteller? No, I'm a filmmaker who also talks. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Do you think mainstream uh, uh, you making could learn something from uh, your uh, type of filmmaking and work? I don't think they could learn some, something, and I don't care. And, and because they learn from, from themselves, uh, uh, they learn from, as I say, from, uh, from from the banks, what will sell, you see? And then they do it because they, want, they have to make money. You see, this is also, uh, if you make a film that costs $200 million, it is clear that you, the money must come back somehow. If not, you, there will be one film made and this will be the end of the film industry. Now you're talking about the most commercial films. But there are only most commercial films. Yeah. Part of the media of the mainstream, uh, you see, there are now attempts, let's say, in Europe through subsidizing to create a less mainstream like uh, mainstream cinema. And that is, uh, that I think is, um, uh, I don't think much of that. Because it's like when you have an amateur, uh, for example, when I taught filmmaking, I taught filmmaking. 
people were working with eight millimeter cameras because of lack of money. And I told them, listen, you, 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 you may work with this medium, but you must never try to make an imitation of a 16 millimeter film because you, you will be worse than that. You must make an eight millimeter film, which the 16 millimeter people cannot make. You see? And this, this uh, I would uh, say to the subsidized feature films made, that they should not imitate Hollywood uh, and try to make a presentable mainstream film for a small budget, because Hollywood does this better. And I, I don't go in to, to see these films. I go to Hollywood films if I want to have a, a nice lowbrow uh, uh, view of the world, or I use it as a test. What, what are people thinking now? What is politically correct, you see? What, how would a Mr. Spielberg, who considers himself a free filmmaker because he has so much money, everything is, uh, he does what he wants. He is the, uh, how shall I say, the most, the, sla the, the biggest slave of them all because he is so self-domesticated that he thinks, it's like a slave who thinks he's free because he's allowed to drink with two hands, either like this or like this, you see? But what he drinks is the, is the shit that his, his master gives him. Yes. Time that uh, you stay till tomorrow, and uh, so I hope we can kind of broke you. Sure. To you during your stay in Vilinska. Yes. I wanted to thank you so much for coming back and the Austrian Embassy in Norway for supporting this uh, event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.